So do I have time to do hair and makeup? Um, oh, I got my lipstick on this again. Oh, wow, it's a nice color. Yeah, yeah. you like it? Yeah. It's purple. Purple, yeah. nice. Welcome to the 21st episode of Femgineer TV, brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Pornima Vijay Shankar, the founder of Femgineer. In this show, I host innovators, and together we debunk myths and misconceptions when it comes to building tech companies and products. There are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to working at a growth stage tech company. And when I say growth stage, I mean one that has millions of customers around the world and is potentially going to exit for millions or even billions of dollars. Well, in today's episode, we're going to tackle some of those misconceptions. And to help us out, I've invited my good friend, Pedram Kayani, who is currently the Director of Growth Engineering at Uber. Prior to working at Uber, Pedram was a director at Facebook and got his start as a software engineer at Google. Well, thanks for joining us today, Pedram. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I think we met back in 2007, or maybe it was before that, but I want to go way back to the very beginning. What got you interested in tech and lured you into startup land? Sure. Uh, I think the first time I got excited about computers was when my parents brought home an Atari, and I started playing Frogger, yeah. and I got really excited about video games. and. Grew up playing more and more video games, and one day I was like, you know what, I want to make these things. Um, started studying computer science in college, and the funny thing is, I actually never made a single video game, but it led me to some really interesting places. Yeah, why, why didn't you ever make a video game? Um, I took some graphics courses, and I realized that they were far more tedious uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and math-based than okay. I actually was excited about. So your first role was as a software engineer at Google around 2005, so right after the IPO. Tell me what that was like. Yeah, Google was an amazing place to work at. First job out of college, people around me were super excited to build technology. It was like a playground for engineers. And the, the most striking part about it was that most of the people that I was working with had all of a sudden become incredibly rich. And there was like this humbleness there that yeah. was very, uh, to me, it was very striking that all these people no longer had to work and they still loved what they were doing and no one was flashy about it. And that stuck with me throughout my career. Mm -hmm. So since this was your first experience at a growing tech company, what were some of the challenges that you experienced? Yeah, the, the biggest challenge for me was that in school, you have to learn everything and figure it out on your own. And if you get your answers from other people, it's called cheating. Yeah. Whereas uh, in, in, in the work environment, actually, you're supposed to work with people. You're supposed to collaborate with people and, and come to the solution better and faster. And that took me a while to figure out. And I would spend a lot of time in the early days just reading tons and tons of documentation when I could have gotten the, the answer from someone sitting right next to me in, in two minutes. So it took me a little while to figure that out. And what were some critical skills that you think you experienced while you were there? Uh, I think the, the first thing at, at Google that I learned is that if you invest in your infrastructure and you build things that you can leverage, you can mm -hmm. actually build incredible product experiences on top of it. Yeah. Um, so just getting the basics of building for, uh, for developers. And then um, the other thing is just communication, collaboration, how do you formulate your ideas and how do you get them across to a group of people? Because it's not always it's not always that you have to have the best idea, it's that you have to have the best idea that you can communicate to people and get them on board with it. So what's an example of an idea that you had when you were at Google? Yeah, so one of the things that I saw, I was working on Orkut, which mm -hmm. was a social network very popular yeah. in, in India and in, um, in Brazil. And one of the things that I saw was that there was a high volume of um, pornographic material uh -huh. on the site. And actually, this was an example that didn't work well in terms of I couldn't convince other people to see, see that this was a problem. Okay. Um, so I just went and built a bunch of tools on my own to be able to identify this and, and create power tools to remove it all. And um, so I went and did this on my own. People saw the power of this thing. And a lot of people in the company actually started contributing to it. So if I'd been able to convince other people uh, we might have gotten there faster, but right. as a result of me not being able to convince them, I had to build it on my own. So I learned a lot in the process. So then you left Google to join Facebook, and you joined pretty early on. Why did you decide to leave? Yeah, I was using Facebook all the time. Okay. And it was very compelling to go and work on something that I was using and that uh, be part of a very tiny team. I think mm -hmm. at the time, the company was like 200, 250 people, um, not a lot of people in engineering. So... Um, I wanted to actually have an impact on something that I was using 
for maybe hours a day at the time. It was your new video game. It was basically my new video game, yeah. exactly, with real people instead of characters. Yeah. Um, another thing that was really exciting about it was that a lot of the technology hadn't been built yet. So I got the chance to just build things from scratch. Cool. And um, I think that was very formative for me to be able to like say that I built something big and complex and know that I have the capability of doing that. Mm-hmm. It gave me a lot of confidence. And what was your initial role then at Facebook? Yeah, initially, no one really had a lot of yeah. roles. I, I went in and I solved you know, bugs and uh, fixed problems. I started to gravitate towards um, spam protection mm-hmm. uh, because I'd done some of it at Google before. And it was one of those things where you can see the value of it. If mm-hmm. the graph has a lot of trust in it, people will use it more. Yeah, that makes sense. So you were at Facebook for a little over seven years, and you started off building, and then eventually you transitioned into a management role. What was that like, that transition for you? Yeah, the, um, <laughs> becoming a manager is one of those really challenging things, because yeah. uh, in school you learn how to write code. No one teaches you how to manage other people. So it was, it took a lot of time to actually become a good manager, and I, I did it out of necessity. Our team was just growing rapidly. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there wasn't a dedicated manager just for my team, and so I kind of grew into the role organically. And given that the company and the team were growing so quickly, what was that like for you on a personal level? It was it was exciting. It was challenging. Again, it was like a new role where I just I didn't know the answers and I had to figure a lot of things out. And I was very lucky to be in a company that really puts a lot of emphasis on teamwork and collaboration. So a lot of people say that they have a very collaborative and teamwork oriented culture. What's an example of that that you can cite from your early days at Facebook? It was You know, we had to be collaborative out of necessity. Mm -hmm. We were much smaller than our competitors. We didn't have the same kind of resources as them. So it was either you work together really effectively and have basically outpaced uh, impact or you fail. So I don't have specific examples. That's just the general way that it came about at Facebook. Okay. So you've been cited as the ringleader of hackathons at Mm -hmm. Facebook. How did you get into this role? Yeah, so... um, the second week that I was at Facebook, we had a hackathon. Mm-hmm. And I remember describing it to my wife like, hey, I'm going to be home tomorrow morning. I'm going to be out here all night long working on ideas and projects. And she thought it was like, what? She never heard of it before. <laughs> yeah. um, it was an incredible experience. I mean, everyone was in the office just working on ideas. We launched most of the things the next morning. Nice. And maybe like two months later, I was asking some some people on my team, like, hey, when's the next hackathon? And they explained like, it's whenever someone wants to have a hackathon. So... I got excited by that. I went right back to my desk. I sent an email saying, I'm going to hack tomorrow night. Who wants to come? I'll get Chinese food and we'll do it. Yeah. And most of the engineering came the next night and we had a hackathon. And so from then on, I just started sending these emails out. And over time, it just became a thing. It was uh, it was really cool to see it go from you know, 40, 50 engineers mm-hmm. to hundreds and then thousands of engineers and having to, to scale this thing up for the entire company because a 40-person hackathon is very different than a multi-thousand person hackathon. Yeah. And aside from the product, how do you think it helped the culture? I think a lot of the the, the stress of having to launch something in 12 hours yeah. gets you to really focus on what's important and what's not important. And mm-hmm. that's, like I think, a critical skill that, that you have to uh, get a lot of practice doing because usually when you start an idea, you get very excited. Like, right. oh, we could do this and that and the other thing. And then when you realize, oh, I have five hours left to do this thing, all of a sudden, those crazy ideas like are no longer important. Like the, the essence of your idea becomes the thing that you really focus on. Mm-hmm. I think that's a, a pretty critical part of hackathons and what makes companies again be able to focus. And then also just having a small number of people that you have to collaborate with in a short period of time. So yeah. all the unnecessary process and things just fly out the window. And you get in a room about this big with a group of people and the, the kinds of energy that it creates and the bonds across the company are just. They live on beyond the hackathon. That's great. So it actually helped with a lot of the culture later on in yeah, the company. Yeah, I believe that it helped. It's, it's, we scaled it with the company, and yeah. I think it scaled our culture as a company too. So I've also read that you were pretty instrumental in developing a culture of empathy. How do you do that as your team is growing and you've got millions of customers around the globe, right? It's yeah. got to be a challenge to take the time out to do that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more work, mm-hmm. but... I think my philosophy is that meaningful work gets done in teams. Mm -hmm. So you can't do anything meaningful just by yourself. It's a a team thing. So that if you understand that your teammates, their goals, their priorities, the challenges that they face, put a little of investment in that. As a team, you actually get a lot more done. So um, that goes as far as being very transparent about your your strengths and your weaknesses, your your victories and your losses on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that it pays for itself. But some people might be opposed to being 
vulnerable or seeing this as a needed tool for managing teams. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, so uh, you can't have any of this unless you have the core of trust. Mm -hmm. And I think my the way that I do it is that I show my vulnerability and I also show that like I don't take myself too seriously. Yeah. And I um, feel like I, I can live that. I just bring up the goofiness to work. And yeah. a lot of people, re it resonates with them and it makes it easier for them. So what do you think made it easier for you to actually go out and champion these hackathons? Was there some sort of secret pedram sauce or was it being goofy? You know, how did you get buy-in from management? And as the company grows, more process comes into place. You know, there's board of directors, all that stuff going on, sure. right? Uh, you know, actually, there was never any approval process okay. uh, either at any of the companies that I've been at. I think yeah. the best technology companies, the people at the top understand that all the best ideas come from the people with creative energy. So mm -hmm. um, I do have to do, for all the hackathons I've, I've run um, at Facebook and at Uber, I have to do a lot of legwork. I have to go get buy-in from other leaders within the company because, again, anytime you're in an environment where there's a lot of stuff going on, yeah. um, you know, people don't have time and energy. Right. It's like, oh, I'm going to stay late tonight or tomorrow night. Um, <clears throat> so I had to go and get a lot of excitement from people. So um, that's, that's where a lot of the energy goes, but not getting buy-in from management. I think they... They understand that you have to experiment with things like this. Yeah, and they were open to it. They oh, yeah. they weren't like, what's the ROI of this hackathon no, afterwards? No, 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 no. Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah. And what do you think your biggest impact was while you were at Facebook? So I built the site integrity team from a very early stage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's pretty instrumental in just like the, the trust and the, the social graph. Mm -hmm. um, hackathons and scaling those. And I was very inclusive in how I, I built that out. And I, I brought people in and I tried to champion them becoming the face of Hackathon as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the big things I did was I tried to live the culture and the, the values, even when it was hard. Because yeah. actually that's when it's most meaningful that you lean into the, the cultural values is when they kind of work against you in the short term. What do you, what, give me an example of that. I mean, being open. That's, yeah. like, that's a big one uh, at, um, at both companies, actually. Yeah. And it's being able to talk about, again, your victories and your losses. And um, you have to lean into that. It's, it's not an easy thing to do a lot of the times. So after seven years of being at Facebook, you decided that you wanted to join Uber. Yeah. Uh, tell us why you decided to leave Facebook and why you wanted to join Uber. Sure. So um, like I think most Uber employees, I yeah. had a magical Uber experience. Oh, where, okay. Yeah. What uh, was this? I was just stranded in the city uh -huh. and uh, me and my wife were stranded and, and she pulled out her phone and said, hey, I'll just get an Uber. She pushed a button and a car was there a couple of minutes later. Nice. And I was just like, oh my God. This is amazing. This is like magic. Yeah. And, um, you know, and ever since that night, I just kept thinking about like, what if you could do this in every city, everywhere in the world? Mm -hmm. Like, what's the technology behind this? And I started just thinking about it all the time. Um, the nice thing is I have many friends who, who came to Uber, yeah. have conversations with them. I came to the office and I checked it out and met with the people. And I'm just like, okay, I see the hunger and I see that, that kind of that first like 1% of the problem is solved, but there's so much more to do. Mm -hmm. And, and I just couldn't, I couldn't hold back my, my excitement. So. Yeah. so what's your current role at Uber? So I run engineering for our uh, global growth teams uh -huh. and we focus on China, India, other emerging markets like Southeast Asia, Latin America, EMEA. And so that's the product is in these places or your teams are in these places? So our team, most of our team is here, mm -hmm. but they build the products to get the riders and drivers onto our platform. So eliminating any of the friction that may slow them down from experiencing Uber and mm -hmm. being able to incorporate it into their daily lives. So how do your teams get to know the local geographies? Do they travel there? How do they get the information to build the app sure. for the geographies? So most of our engineers are here mm -hmm. in San Francisco, but we travel to and from China and mm -hmm. India and other markets quite a bit. We also have an office in Bangalore where mm -hmm. we, we've just started an engineering team there. So we, we go back and forth. We meet with the ops people. We actually talk to drivers and riders and, and try to like prioritize effectively so that we make sure that we grow our, our market share faster. Yeah. Now, I have used you guys all over the globe, as, as long as it's in one of the cities. And one of the things that I find really fascinating is how seamless the app is. Like, yeah. I don't have to download an Uber for London or for yeah. somewhere in China. It's just there automatically. I'm assuming that's kind of baked in as well into the experience. That's baked in. There's a lot of work that goes into creating that yeah. magical experience wherever you go. So yeah. there's local technological challenges that we mm -hmm. always have to be thinking about and making sure that once you get out of that airport, 
there's a car that yeah. can push the button. So that's, nice. that's our obsession. So it's been almost two years since you started at Uber. How has the engineering team transformed since you started? Sure. So when I joined, Uber was in about 100 cities, mm-hmm. and now we're in 450. So we're oh, wow. much more international as a company. So yeah. a lot more focus on making sure that the experience in all these different countries is is top notch. So we've hired engineers and built out teams to create that seamless experience across the, the world. Mm-hmm. Um, we've also grown quite a bit. So when I joined, my team was about 20, 25 engineers. Oh, and, small, yeah. Yeah, and, and then it grew to about 250 wow. engineers in a really short period of time. And in that time, what's been the biggest challenge, like going from 20 to 200, you know, you're 10xing your employees? Yeah, so uh, on my team, we have grown quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And so the challenge is actually, as you scale out these teams, are they scaling in a balanced way? Do you uh-huh. have the right leadership in place? Are you developing people's skills? Um, you know, there's always uh, a... There's always a, a competing pressure as grow so that you can get more stuff done. If right. you go too quickly and you don't develop your people, then they're actually far less effective. And then you just have big and effective teams. So spending a lot of time to like refine what are the qualities of engineering that we want? How do we make sure that we're mentoring people? And then as these teams grow, the communication overhead increases. Yeah. So teaching them about how to be really effective in your updates and how your teams work together and creating good boundaries between what the teams are doing so they can work independently as well. As well. So it's been really challenging, uh, kinds of problems that are amazing to have. And yeah. I've, I've learned so much in the process of, of building out these teams. Yeah. And I imagine that it's also a challenge where you want people to build, but you also have to cultivate them internally. And how have you managed that versus like hiring people externally to join the team? Sure. So our the goal is to try to Hire as slowly as possible. Oh, really? Okay. And, and build out as much of like leadership and technical depth from the people who've been around longer. Okay. Now you do have to balance that. It's it's great because now as as we are such a, a great brand, we're able to hire the best engineers from all the other top mm-hmm. companies. So you can accelerate the the skill sets that you have in your team. And still, because the surface area of our product is growing and the number of problems that we're tackling is growing. Everyone still has more and more opportunities to grow. So it works out for everyone. Yeah. And why do you think it's important to cultivate internally versus bring somebody from outside that's more senior, or more experienced? Yeah, I think the biggest part of that is that uh, you can only absorb outside culture and values and influences mm-hmm. at a certain rate. If you do it too quickly, you lose the core of what makes your company what it is. Uh-huh. And there's all these great companies out there, but we're not trying to be right. any of these other companies. We're trying to be the best Uber, the company that's going to be amazing 10, 20, 30 years from now. Now, as a director, you're coaching a lot of people. What would you describe is your style? Um, my my management style or my coaching style? Your coaching style. My coaching style, um, I call it the dumb manager. Okay. And actually, one of my managers taught this to me, which is you ask lots of questions. So someone will come to you with a problem. And your natural instinct is to solve their problem. Like I'm having a conflict with my coworker. Okay, well, this is what you need to do. Yeah. Um, and the other approach, the one I take is ask, why are you having this conflict? Why do you think they don't see your point of view? What would it take for you to see their point of view? And you just walk them down this path sure. until they effectively have solved their own problem. But they also saw how they got there as well. Nice. Does and this piss people off? It's, it's frustrating. <laughs> yeah. And a, a two-minute conversation turns into a half-an-hour conversation. Right. And it's not super scalable because you can't do it with everyone sure. at all times. So you have to you have to pick and choose when you do it. Yeah. But it's it teaches them far more than than just giving them the answer. Nice. And how do you think that this coaching style has changed over the years? Um, I think the biggest thing is initially I didn't have a coaching style. Okay. As as a techno like someone in the technical field who's writing code to right. coaching, I just want to give people answers yeah. initially. And so I had to learn to have this patience and, and actually say like, you know. I have to cultivate these people because effectively my job is to work myself out of a job. If I'm making the most important decisions for my team, then they are in deep trouble because I'm supposed to hire smarter people than me. So I have to get them to the point where they're able to solve these problems. So we have a number of viewers out there who are parents. And one of their concerns is having some amount of balance between having time with their family, but then, of course, doing the work that they want to do. It's not always a fine balance, but I know you're a dad, so maybe you can walk us through how you manage it and how you coach your employees as well who are parents. Sure, sure. So having a family that you love and want to spend time with and a job that gets you excited and you yeah. want to focus on, um, those both of those require time, and, and each of them, you have to be focused on them when you're around them. Um, so the way that I do it is I basically cut out anything that's not 
family, work, or very close friends. Mm -hmm. um, so I've had to actually had to learn to say no to a lot of things that I typically would say yes to and really be um, smart about my time as well. So I, I wake up super early. Yeah. I go for a run. I get ready for the day. I spend time with my kids um, and make them breakfast and get them ready for, for school, go to work. And then I come back in the time that I can, usually I can uh, have dinner with them, give them a bath and, and put them to bed. Yeah. Um, so I, I try to teach my team that, you know, it's not about working harder. It's about working smarter and being more focused around when you're, when you're focused on your family, when you're focused on your work and saying no to things that don't matter. I'm sure it's hard, though, for people because they might want to please you as their boss or their team or feel like, oh, well, you know, Uber's growing and I want to participate in that. So how do you kind of give them a gentle nudge to take time off or attend to their needs? Yeah, I, I think it's it's important to not focus on when people are, are right in the office mm -hmm. and they don't have to, they shouldn't optimize for visibility. They should optimize for impact, Okay. right? Getting the most important things done, being there when it matters is right. actually more important than just being there all the time. Yeah. And and helping, especially people who this is maybe their their first big job, mm -hmm. understand that is is pretty critical. And how do you go about doing that? I show them when I take time off, and mm -hmm. I show them that I can be really effective at my job and also be effective in my my family time. Mm -hmm. So you do a lot of coaching, and as a director, you've got a big team that's 10x. But who coaches you? Do you have any mentors or sponsors over the years? I, I've been really blessed. I've had some really amazing managers mm -hmm. at Facebook. Uh, my previous director and our VB of engineering were uh, are still people who I lean on. Mm -hmm. uh, but most importantly, I actually run all of my, my big problems with my wife, and she's my best coach. Nice. Yes, we'll do a shout-out to Rahale. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. For our viewers out there who may be excited about joining a growth stage company, but a little apprehensive, right? What's one piece of advice that you would give them? My biggest advice is don't be afraid. Uh, people typically underestimate what they're capable of. Yeah. So if you get excited about something, lean into it, do it, and uh, be really focused. And I think the, the most important advice is uh, marry someone that's <laughs> smarter than you. Okay, good. Yeah. So what are some things that you have brought over from Facebook and installed into the culture here at Uber? Sure. The, the biggest one, I think, is hackathons. Okay. Uh, they've done a couple of hackathons here at Uber, and now I've taken them on. We've done, I think, four by now. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that's really exciting about the hackathons is that engineers get to uh, interface with Travis directly on their products. Cool. So as we're doing our hackathons, he's walking around, he's sitting down with the teams, and they get to jam and they get to work with an entrepreneur who's built a business from nothing yeah. on crazy ideas that they have. And I think that's that's one of the things where I get the most excited and proud out yeah. about because we see our engineers and our designers and our PMs just bring an extra level of creativity to the job. Nice. Do you have any upcoming or do you have any for the public? Like per no okay. public hackathons. Okay. But no if you're excited about hackathons at Uber, you just send me your resume and I will... I will make sure that you get uh, get a seat to our next hackathon. Awesome. Wonderful. Anything else you'd like our viewers to know? I want them to know that we are hiring. Awesome. We are super excited about the mission of our company and what we're trying to do. And if people get really excited about what we're doing, we'd love for them to send their resumes, check out our job page, and see you soon. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Pedram. This has been a complete pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun for me, too. Yeah. And thanks to all you viewers out there for tuning in today. And special thanks to our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker, for their help in producing this episode of Femgineer TV. If you've enjoyed this episode, then please share it with your friends, your teammates, and your bosses. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive the next episode. Ciao for now. This episode of Femgineer TV is brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. Build better software faster. Let me kind of practice my. Oh! I'm excited to be here! Otherwise, I'll be like, hello, how are you? And should I look at that camera or should I look at her? Be like, yeah. <laughs> it's just going to be look like this. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Ped. Oh, wow! Perfect time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's perfect. Yeah, it's like, it thanks for joining us. The Ooh. lights go out. Yeah.